Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you to our new house and Syracuse University alumni, our students and friends for joining us today mm -hmm. on our discussion on how the coronavirus has and will affect the future of sport. I am Olivia Stomsky, the director of the Newhouse Sports Media Center, and it's my honor and privilege <coughs> to moderate today's discussion. Um, so I'd like to welcome in host and play-by-play -play with NBC Sports Group and 1988 grad Mike Tirico and play-by-play -play announcer for CBS, Yes Network, TNT, and Westwood One Radio, 1990 grad Ian Eagle. Thank you both so much for joining us today and being with us um, on this great afternoon. We want to get started pretty quickly. We're going to be talking about quite a few topics today. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions um, with the chat, and we will try to get to those as quickly as possible. So starting off, um, both of you have been very busy during this time. Um, a lot of people say and think that because there are no sports being played, there's no sports to talk about. And that is definitely untrue. Uh, Mike, we'll start with you. You are on the air for hours and hours a day, almost seem like you may be busier now than you were before. I, I feel like I am. I hope everybody can hear me. Hi, everyone. Good to see and hear everybody. I thought this was with Noah Eagle. I signed up to do this <laughs> with Noah. So um, apparently, apparently this will be Ian. So I'll, maybe I can duck out after a half hour and uh, move on. Uh, no, I've, I've been doing a TV show from here, uh, my office. I'm three, three steps from my desk. Uh, we've set up a ring light, an iPad, uh, a re net return monitor, a microphone, and I've been doing a TV show from here uh, every day, noon to one. So it's been fun. Like you get up in the morning, you prep for a show, you do a show, you have lunch. All of a sudden you look around, it's two o'clock and you've occupied a day, which is a godsend uh, for a lot of us uh, because there's been so little of our normal life and normal work and normal routine of travel. Uh, but it has been, it has been fun. I've gotten to speak with a lot of people, interview a lot of guests, and that's been a blast for me because it's been catching up with people who I don't see as much anymore, not doing basketball or some baseball friends or things like that. So uh, hopefully it's filled some time for people at home. Uh, it's filled digital content for our company. And uh, I guess this is all about adapting. So that's what we've been trying to do on this end. Well, and I am moving to you, bringing up Noah, um, both of you play-by-play -play announcers without live yeah. sports being played. It's a little hard to, to call games, but you've both been very busy creating content together and separately. Yeah, if we called play-by-play -play around the house, uh, I think my wife would go absolutely nuts. So we're not doing that. That, that would not be a good look. Uh, I want to mention that I first met Mike Tarico in 1987, fittingly at a sporting event, sideline of a high school football game in Syracuse. <laughs> and I walked back to my car that night after meeting him, and I thought to myself, if I could just share a Zoom with Mike 33 yeah. years later, that Pretty would much. complete my career. So mm -hmm. this Good. is a big moment, very big moment for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I stay busy. Uh, I also have a light, a ring light. So I'm my own lighting director, I'm my own yeah. audio guy, I'm my own cameraman. I have a true appreciation for what everybody does on a broadcast. You know, I think I speak for Mike when we both would tell you that we really miss the action, mm -hmm. but we also miss the interaction. Uh, that is such a big part of what we do, bonding with our teammates. And that's what they are when you're on a television sporting event. It's collaborative. And that part of the job has been a big void as well because of the relationships that are formed when you do this for a living for so many years. Well, and talking about getting back to that, we had some announcements this week. Mike, uh, you were the one to tell us, along with commissioners, um, NHL makes a big announcement uh, for those that uh, didn't hear it. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit what that means with sports and the return of them? Yeah, uh, hockey is going to come back in theory in early August. And this is all the biggest if of all time. It's if everything continues to go as planned. Uh, hockey announced, uh, Gary Bettman was on with us, Don Fear, the head of the Players Association, that their plan right now is to try to get teams back on the ice as individuals, groups of no more than six sometime next month in June, which is as early as next week. And then early July, hope to have some training camp 
situation set up. And they set up a new format, too. 24 teams are going to play for the Stanley Cup. The round robin, 12 in each conference, will get down to the eight, which is traditional, and then they'll go. But they're going to do it in two cities, at least until the conference finals. They'll do one city for the Eastern Conference, one city for the West. It's not necessarily going to be an East and a West city, not necessarily going to be one American, one Canadian city. The border issue with Canada is a little bit different and is going to provide some uh, hurdles that they have to get over. But hockey is planning on that. Um, I can get us up to speed on the NBA. Obviously, the Premier League just announced in the UK that soccer is coming back as early as June 17th with two matches. So they're going to try to finish their season. So what the last week to 10 days has been is I, I sense the tent poles being put up for how we can return to sports all without fans. NASCAR has been the first. They've done it well. Golf is two weeks from today. So here we go down this new road. And the questions are going to come when we hit the first pothole. When we have the first really significant outbreak within, then we're going to have questions to answer. And like the questions we all get, it's a big if and a big we don't know at this point. And as Mike stated, he stated it perfectly. We are in a phase now of optimism, which is wonderful, but there's also a lot of speculation. Uh, NHL coming forward and showing us what the plan was, was an immense step. The NBA has been very patient. Uh, They do not want to jump the gun here. So all the rumors that we had been hearing over the last month, everything was on the table. Mm -hmm. And we are getting closer to an actual plan, but they're not quite there yet. They have to get everybody on the same page. And that's asking a lot uh, when it comes to the the Players Association, uh, front office. All of these moving parts are still in play. So the the way the schedule looks right now for the EA, they're talking to GMs today, Board of Governors tomorrow. They will present the options. And then the hope is by next week, they will have a resolution to resume play in Orlando, single site, and still question marks. But the fact that we are now taking the steps towards getting back is a really good sign, but it still requires a great deal of conjecture. And we don't have answers to to many questions. And I think that's why you've seen a hesitancy from the league in going public. They don't want to create this sense that everything is taken care of. It is not. Well, and one of the things that, that Mike just brought up is this idea of, of sporting events without fans. What does that sound like for the viewers at home? There's been discussions on pumping in fake crowd noise. Is that something that we're considering? Um, are we considered, you know, are we concerned with the sounds that we will pick up? I mean, thinking about the NBA, you may have those, the squeaking of the shoes, but you also may have bad words and people <laughs> yelling at each other. What are your thoughts on that? I am first on, on where we're going to go <laughs> with fans. Yeah. Yeah, so somewhere down the priority list Did you guys, is I, television. I think I may have... And of course, it's a big part of it. But right now, no, I, I heard you, Olivia, in regards to uh, the natural sounds. Uh, look, the reality is mm-hmm. the way that the NBA has been set up, and Mike knows this, he's been around the league. When they've mic'd up players, when they've mic'd up coaches in the past, All of that is edited material that's vetted by an NBA official in the truck. They do not want players mic so that you can freely hear the back and forth and the banter. Uh, That's not what the NBA is looking for. So uh, the questions have been posed. Would there be some kind of soundtrack with crowd noise for NBA games, for NFL games? Still up in the air, but my sense of it is that the NBA will want to create a cacophony of sounds to make sure that you're not picking up everything that's going on on the court between player, coach, player, player, coach, official, player, official. Uh, This is 
not something that the NBA would want public. And I understand why. I sit courtside. I do hear a lot of it. And uh, it, it's probably <laughs> not going to go over well. For some, for some fans, they would love it, Mike. But for the most part, uh, this, this would right. not pass yep. the FCC license. No, if the uh, if the well, players use choice language, from... then we get to as broadcasters. So that, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure that that's how it works, but um, we do have a question from Peter <laughs> okay, I see. Um, and and Mike. Mike, if you could answer it, uh, do you think the time off will lead to more rabid interest or decreased interest in sports moving forward? Yeah, I think the ratings are going to improve. Uh, even the NASCAR races that have been on, the ratings have been better. So I think we're going to see better uh, TV ratings initially out of the gate with all these sports. Now, what's going to happen going forward, I think, is the bigger question in the revenue world. Are people going to come back to football games? Uh, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as a lot of folks may have heard. So you take 100,000 people in the big house times seven home games at 700,000, and then Put whatever figure is the average spend, ticket, merchandise, uh, hot dog, popcorn. If that's a hundred bucks, start doing the math of seven hundred times or seven seven hundred thousand times one hundred, and quickly you're up at seventy million dollars there, and you're talking about a lot of revenue. And that's on the low end. I haven't put in seat licenses, everything else. So the interest level in sports may be higher in TV ratings, people watching. But will the revenue generation be there? Because part of the joy of watching on TV is, ah, that looks great. I want to go be a part of that. Oh, I can't wait till our home stadium is louder than their home stadium. I'm going to give my team a real home field advantage. People are going to be hesitant to go to the games. And I know in talking to team presidents, and I'm sure Ian's done the same, there's a lot of concern about what the economic model of sports is going to look like going forward. So while I think people will really enjoy having the diversion of, uh, a, a NASCAR race, a golf tournament, eventually hockey playoffs in July and August and NBA playoffs in August. And there are going to be games like all day, all night to get all of them in, in one site. That'll be fun. But what is it going to do for the bigger picture model of sports? I think short term, you will create uh, new pockets of fans just to have this live, fresh content out there waiting for us. Well, in, in looking at what this looks like for the athletes, we have a question from Cindy. Um, and do you think that that we'll be able to pull off, and Mike, this is obviously for you, pull off and move forward as we start planning for the Olympics? What does that look like for athletes traveling from different countries? Um, what are your thoughts on how that, that will turn out? <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's the one I've gotten the most often, that and the NFL. And I think the benefit that both entities have is a long runway. Uh, you know, the National Football League has a long window of time coming up here with everything they're doing to figure out how to get players back before basketball and hockey have to get their answers in Major League Baseball. On the Olympic side of the coin, they have a full year plus. So even right now, here we are in May, we would still be 60 days away, just under 60 days away from the start of the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. That's a full 300 days to figure out what's worked at the Bundesliga in Germany, what's looked at the Premier League, and what have they done, and what has the NBA done, and all the sports leagues around the globe. I think you could see a situation where they ask the athletes to come to Tokyo early, quarantine there, know that they're there early in July, everybody's safe, now we can have a games. We have, look, we have no idea what September is going to look like. We have no idea what December is going to look like. We have absolutely no clue what next July is going to look like. So I think they're planning as if it can be as normal and set up with modifications given the changed world that we live in. But, you know, six, 60 days ago, if somebody came to you, 60, yeah, 60 days, if somebody came to you and said, hey, by the way, you're going to have like five different masks that you're going to wear to go to the supermarket and pick up food you would have thought the person was off the planet Mars. So everything's going to keep changing and evolving. I think the runway of time that the Olympics has being the longest uh, will give them the best possible chance to, to pull this thing off. And, and 
I am going to you a question from Jojo is how do you see the professional athletes coming back say, especially in men's basketball, you need to be close to each other to play that sport. And there's pretty, um, it would be pretty difficult for them to be playing with masks. So there's no social distancing in, in sports such as basketball. Do you see them getting <laughs> back in the gym soon? And what will that look like for the athletes as they move forward? You know, sometimes we see athletes as superheroes and that's just not the case. They're normal people that have the same fears and the same concerns that you and I have. And I know these questions have been raised already. So as the NBA is trying to plan on resuming play, one of the biggest concerns is going to be the health and safety of their players, of their coaches, of their staff members, of the officials, and anyone who's deemed essential to be in the bubble format of Orlando. And there is no playbook here. It might just mention that the NFL and the Olympics, their best friend right now is time because that will allow them to form a playbook and learn from others' potential mistakes. I think the key that the NBA recognizes now moving forward, this cannot be a house of cards. If they restart this, have a three-week training camp, get the teams, however many there will be, some say 16, some say 20, some say all teams, all 30. My sense is eventually they're going to figure out they're going to have to do 16 teams, maybe 20 and maybe a play-in format for the playoffs. But once they get the players into this area in Orlando, they can't stop play if one athlete tests positive. It can't fall apart based on that. They have to have provisions in place, removing the athlete, removing the player, and continuing, but doing it in a way that provides a safe place for the players, maybe a limited number of family members. NFL, look, let's face it, contact sport, 53 players on a team, normally preseason, 90 players trying to vie for a spot on an NFL roster in close quarters, in locker rooms, on the field. So this is not a simple fix by any stretch. And I think this is part of the reason why we're not fast tracking anything right now. Uh, they've dipped their toe in the pool and now it's seeing whether or not they can swim. And with each day that goes by, if they can swim a bit farther. And, and Mike, talking, uh, you know, as Ian said, we're, we're setting up these procedures. We're worried and, and concerned about not only the fans, but the media, the athletes. As we start looking towards college football, we have a question from Jonathan. What, are, what do you think will happen with college football? Uh, should we be optimistic or do you think they're going to need some more time? I'm more optimistic than I was two weeks ago, Olivia, uh, but I'm still not 100% there. Uh, I, I really do think this is going to be a major change moment for intercollegiate athletics all the way around, not just for, for our brand, for Syracuse, I, I think for everyone. College athletics has gotten out of whack for a variety of reasons, and this may be the seismic event that helps restructure college athletics. I could be uh, alone in this. I could be too far down the p path on this, but uh, I think this is going to be th that big event. Let's just start with the concept of, I'm going to get too deep in the woods here, so I'll try to keep it brief. 95% of the conversation not related to the games are people on the debate shows yelling about oh, these athletes deserve this and name like this an image and all of that stuff. Never. Never in those debates with those loudmouths do they ever talk about that students do get a full scholarship on the academic yeah. side in most of these cases. There are scholarships that are split up amongst the Olympic sports. But all these players that they debate about, they get a full scholarship. Every person who's on this call who paid for their college knows that's really valuable. At Syracuse, at private schools, that's incredibly valuable. We're talking $70,000 plus dollars a year of value. Nobody ever brings that up on first take. I just thought I'd make that point. So there's going to be a huge cost 
to start with in college athletics. College athletics has hurt itself by piling on with high coaches' salaries and building slides in football offices in the SEC and you know, some silly stuff, right? They've got to figure out how to rebalance all of this. The college football money pays for most of the Olympic sports. College basketball, some. College football and the Power Five is the big revenue generator for most of the Olympic sports. So all of the Title IX, the number of scholarships, most, I shouldn't say all, most of all of that generates off of revenue generated from football, basketball. In some cases, in some schools, you have a third sport that generates revenue, baseball in the SEC, it would it be lacrosse for Syracuse, women's basketball at UConn? Look, those types of things do happen. But across the board, you get my sense. Why do I bring all of this up? College sports has gotten so far away from the mission of the colleges and universities. And I think this is going to take it back to connecting the missions of the colleges and universities to athletics. If you want to go play in the G League and don't go to college, college isn't for you. We wish you well. Knock yourself out. Have fun. That's the way America should be. Football. I love Jim Harbaugh's idea. If you're a freshman and you're ready to go to the NFL, go get it. We wish you well. But for the majority of the athletes, they're students too. They go to class. They come out far better as people because of their degree. So the mission of educating student athletes, which does happen at our campus uh, very significantly, our academic stuff is great. Tommy Powell in athletics has done an unbelievable job under John Wildhack's leadership to build our academics. I think that scenario makes this basic point that comes to answer the question. Students on campus leads to a college football season. Students in a virtual world taking classes online, no college football season. No college football season, no money for the Olympic sports, big challenges for the future of intercollegiate athletics. That's why some people are keeping alive the possibility of playing college football in the spring. There are a lot of things and a lot of different conversations to me, they have to start with, if the kids are not on campus in class, there can't be college football. And if you say, we're not going to have classes on, cap on campus, but we're going to play college football, then that has nothing to do with the Michigan University. And I think college athletics is in the wrong place forever at that point. So that's why I think it all ties back to what's going to happen on the campuses. And you hear a lot of schools saying, here's our plan, we're going to go. But if the health folks say there's been a spike, no, no big gatherings, no dorms, that's done. And then football is done. So I think it's out of the hands of the football folks. Now, it's a long way to answer that question, but I do think there's an interconnect with every one of those points to get back to that decision. Are we going to see Syracuse at week three in the dome or not? It ends up being a bit of a domino effect as we find out some information on one front. It may lead us to more information on another. Mm -hmm, for sure. No doubt. Awesome. Um, our next question is, uh, I am for you from Shane. We've talked about the idea of no fans. We've talked about how this will change. What do you think will be some changes uh, as far as the media side? Will COVID-19 mean more Remy games? So you're calling games remotely from a monitor. Will there be less reporters? Will you be able to be at games? Um, you obviously can't feed off of the crowd. Yeah. How will that change for you? Yeah, it's an excellent question from Shane, the short-term effect, and the answer is yes. Uh, I think early on, let's take the NBA model as an example. If you're a local broadcaster, you're probably not going to get invited to the bubble in Orlando. You'll be asked to call your games in your local market. If you're the voice of the Milwaukee Bucks, you'll call a Bucks game in a studio in Milwaukee. And I understand uh, this is what they have to do at this early stage uh, to ensure that they have a handle on who's coming in and who's coming out. They can't have large television crews walking in and out of their venues. We get it. What would that mean for the broadcaster? On a personal level, I've experienced it. I've called NBA finals for the world feed from a studio in beautiful Secaucus, New Jersey. The 2013 finals, Miami and San Antonio, that was done <laughs> off of a monitor with a headset on, watching on a big screen. I've done world basketball championships. I've done golf. I've done tennis. It's doable. It's feasible. Is it the same? Of course not. What are you missing out on? The nuances. 
of being at the game, uh, allowing your eyes to see the action that maybe the cameraman or the director or the producer are not seeing in the moment and being able to uh, process the information in a manner that allows you to do your job well. Ultimately, I think that uh, we understand that once fans are allowed back in, then the media might be able to get back to the roles that they're accustomed to. I could tell you this, Mike knows it very well, traveling around, covering the NFL, covering college football, a big part of the job is talking to the athletes and coaches and building up a, a, a bunch of stories so that you have at your disposal once the broadcast begins. That's not going to happen. We're not going to be going into facilities. Uh, we're going to be doing something very similar to what you're looking at right now. Zoom conversations, and it's not the same connection, but it is a way to still get the information that you need. In the short term, the media is very important. The television, the radio coverage, all of it is important but it is not the priority. And I think we're gonna to have to understand that moving forward for print media. It may be a format like this, where you're getting your quotes in this setting and it's pre-game, it's post-game. It's something that we do have to accept at least over the next X number of months that could become a reality in our business. Olivia, if I can just tack on to that, I think two points of what I just talked about are really important for any uh, recent graduates in Newhouse who are in the sports journalism world uh, and for those who, uh, like us, are not recent and been out for a while. The, different, the differentiation point, the difference making is storytelling. And to tell a story, you have to get the first person interaction of questions, answers, follow-ups, backgrounds, even body language when people are answering questions. We're going to be missing that. Writers are really concerned. A lot of my friends who are writers have talked about how the world of going into the locker room for post-game quotes will be gone or post-game, pre-game conversations. That's where you build up a lot of relationships. I think you are going to have to be really entrepreneurial, creative, and um, politely aggressive to be a newer reporter in this industry and try to develop those relationships with athletes until we get back to a more normal time. Uh, because you see the same face for 40 days, you read that person's work and you say that she or he writes a really good, fair story. And every athlete and coach says they don't read it, baloney. They hear and read everything. And especially if it's bad, they know who wrote it. Who is that person? Oh, is that that guy? Is that that lady? Okay, great. They don't give them as good an answer. You do your job the right way. You develop a relationship that is going to be missing. And that's going to be the challenge. Um, the benefit for the people like myself, like Ian, like Al Michaels, like Jim Nance, who we all work with is we've all been doing this for a long time. So the conversation via zoom or video conference might be a little more honest because we've had 15 years of doing this. Uh, a new broadcaster, somebody new to Monday night football, let's say walks in and they're doing their first zoom meeting with Bill Belichick there's no relationship there, it's going to be more of a challenge. So uh, we are going to have to use all the experiences and relationships we have to do the best job to storytell in a way that we have not been taught in a way that we haven't had to use, but we're all going to have to get creative to help the viewer get that knowledge and access that we don't have because we're not there. It's going to be a super challenge, but like Ian said, there are ways around it. We're going to figure it out. So Mike, you bring up new reporters and what it will look like for them. With this surge, once we get back playing sports, there's a good opportunity that several different sports and leagues will be playing at the same time. Do you think that that means right. more opportunities for recent grads and new reporters, um, given the amount of sports being played at, at one time? Yeah, it might, Olivia. I think there's going to be a balance. I think, like Ian said, there's going to be less production locally. Uh, because there may be a lot of world feeds where they just send back the pictures and the that sound. And as Ian said, the, the Bucks broadcasters at Fox Sports Milwaukee uh, broadcasting the game in a studio. So there's not the infrastructure of people who are breaking in on the other side of the camera as there are two or in some cases three. In hockey, sometimes there are four different productions going on out of the same building for different audiences. That will impact one side of it. But as you said, let's say we get to August and the NFL preseason is going. 
and they're on track for a season. And the NHL is in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And the NBA is in the Orlando-based NBA playoffs. And we have golf going back with major championships. And tennis finds a way to get back. And NASCAR is going. And IndyCar is going. And we're getting close to the start of college football season. Those of us who have done multiple sports are going to find that you can't be in eight places unless you just sit in one room and they pipe all the games in. So there are going to be more people, I think, with the opportunity. The problem is reporters on site may be limited. Uh, and because of that, it may be just a counterbalance of a net zero, which is hope it's a net zero and it's not a negative uh, possibility exists, but I wouldn't count on it being a long-term uh, positive for the industry, because I, I do think one of the unfortunate parts of what's happening right now is technology is being used so readily that it's going to shrink our business a little bit because you know, if I and or or myself, if we can set up lights, a camera, and a microphone, which is a challenge for us because it's been so long since we've done it, obviously there are going to be ways to find uh, different cost-cutting measures in the business. And that's a concern, I think, of a lot of us because financially every company, no matter its size, has been hit. And what is that reality going to look like? So uh, that, that's the scary place for our industry going down the line here. Will technology – while well, maybe giving us the chance to broadcast just as many games, not give us the chance to employ as many people in the industry. Yeah, I know that we've discussed on the production side, that's definitely a concern. Uh, our next question from our audience, Ian, is for you. Um, have you been updated at all regards to whether or not local team announcers would be going to Orlando or calling games? Um, those of us that are super fans of certain teams, we love our, our voice of and our local announcers. Do you have any yes. information about that? Early sense, uh, unfortunately, is probably no. Uh, decisions will be made, obviously, down the road once they get a plan in place. But uh, my understanding right now is uh, that would not be the case. Local announcers would be in their home cities and would broadcast from there. So they would be a part of it. You would hear their voices. They'd be part of the broadcast but odds are they would not be at the venue. We mentioned it earlier about how those broadcasts will look. Right. Look, this is a really interesting time in our business. Right. Mike just alluded to it. The standard in which we were accustomed to for television has been lowered. And mm -hmm. in a way, it's been great because everybody can connect from an office, uh, from their backyard, and they could beam you up and put you on TV. Right. The downside to that is uh, it, it's not always great. <laughs> the connection is not great. The backdrop is not great. The sound quality, the picture quality. So uh, Mike knows this from his experience. He's done a number of hits on the Today Show. If you were going to do a hit on the Today Show, odds are they were going to send a truck to your house, park it in the driveway, crank up the satellite and away you go. They're going to get the best possible quality. They would send an audio person. They would send a lighting person. And it might be a four minute spot on the Today Show, but they would go to all of that trouble because they had a certain standard that they adhered to. And right now those standards have gone out the window, understandably so, given our current circumstances. So now with the NBA broadcasts, the idea that we might pipe in some kind of, kind of crowd noise. That would have been taboo. If you mentioned that, you'd say that's contrived, that's wrong. That's not the way we do it. We're all about authenticity. And I think the network's concern is making viewers comfortable more than anything else. It's going to be very striking if you don't hear a bit of crowd noise. And initially when I heard these plans, my instincts were no way. You cannot do that. You cannot put artificial noise on a broadcast. I've warmed to the idea because we've gotten a little taste of it so far. Uh, Mike was part of a golf event a couple of weeks ago. Terrific event. NBC did a tremendous job. And we did get to hear some of the interaction from the golfers. Not in a tournament format, but more of a fun uh, format. I've seen some of the soccer. And uh, while I must say... Uh, Bundesliga doesn't normally pop up on my personal menu. I have sampled it. I don't know if I've ever said the word Bundesliga until <laughs> last week. But now I'm curious. 
I want to see how they're handling it. And yeah, part of their broadcast, there was no sound. And it was a little odd. And it was a little awkward from a viewer standpoint. So uh, I'm very curious to see the creativity that we do uh, encounter from network executives. It's all about pivoting right now and figuring out the best way to present your product. And, and talking about what you hear, um, we have a question from Franklin in Canada. Thanks for um, joining us, Franklin. Franklin directs the NHL games in Canada, and he has a question actually for Mike. If you are allowed to be in the arena um, right. or a sporting event with, with no fans, he would like to know where you would like to sit. Um, mm. Would you prefer to perform at your yeah. craft? Um, where in arena would that make most sense for you? That's a great question, Franklin. I, we don't have to worry about crossing the border. No 14-day quarantine with this question. So thank you for sending it over. Um, you know, it's interesting doing some NHL games, uh, only a few last year and this year. Uh, I noticed most of the broadcast locations are so high. They're at the very top of most of the buildings, which is wonderful to see things develop, but it's virtually impossible to catch the number of the left winger opposite where the broadcast location is. So I'd love to find a location, right? If there are no fans there, I'll take the center ice seats halfway up and do a hockey game from there. I think you could change that perspective a little bit. Uh, for a little inside baseball, I've watched uh, Doc Emmerich and Eddie Olchek, our NHL A team, a number one team, broadcast those outdoor games. And those outdoor games, there's no natural place for a booth. So they broadcast those games at ice level. And I can tell you, you can't see a lot. You lose one corner uh, to the mm -hmm. near side. So you can be too low in hockey. Basketball, that's not the case. But you can be too low uh, for hockey. So for football, there are a couple of press boxes that I'm sure I know Ian will agree with me. There are some that are too high. And so if there are empty sections and we can build a booth in the middle of the 50-yard <laughs> the line section or take over somebody's luxury suite, that would be great. Uh, so there may be opportunities. I think the bigger opportunities will be for camera placement. You can put cameras in places that you never have before because you're not blocking seats. You're not blocking views. So you might be able to give the viewers a more intimate angle or even do cameras that are locked down in those odd spots that you don't normally have that would limit the number of people on the tech crew, give you a shot that's set that you can use for telestrator for analysis back in the studio somewhere. So I do think that the creativity of our industry, plus with the technology of cameras that can go in small places, could be something that benefits all of us from, uh, from smart people like you figuring new things out as we go down the line. Yeah, one uh, quick add-on, Olivia, to, yeah. to what Mike said. Uh, the first tennis event I ever called was a freelance job, a one-off for what was then the A&P Classic in Mawa, New Jersey. Women's event uh, was not an official tournament, but they got big names there. And I was perched up in a broadcast booth. It's literally the first broadcast that I'm doing, and Jennifer Capriati is playing. <laughs> and I'm broadcasting at a level that I'm accustomed to. I'm trying to gauge exactly what volume level I should be at. And the first service game she turns around and stops as she's about to serve the ball and starts pointing <laughs> into the crowd. So I, I do my commentary that Jennifer is waiting for some activity <laughs> to wrap up in the crowd. And she keeps pointing and I realize she's pointing at me. <laughs> she can hear me as I'm broadcasting. And uh, there's that, that realization that, oh, wait a second, the athletes could actually hear you. So yeah. <laughs> uh, right before all of this shut down with the NBA, the Nets were set to play the Golden State Warriors in an empty arena. That was going to be the first game with no fans. The Bay Area had proclaimed that they did not want fans congregating. And the day before, which was the day that everything ended for the NBA when Rudy Gobert tested positive, that was our discussion of where exactly should the broadcasters be. If we're courtside, they're going to hear us. They're going to, I'm, I'm someone that will crank it if something big happens. And even with no crowd, 
you can guarantee that somebody would have heard my call of a slam dunk or an alley-oop. <laughs> and that's a little troubling moving forward. So taking Mike's example probably would be away from the athletes. And I'm sure that's probably what the leagues would want given these yeah. current circumstances. Even for the NBA, there are many locations, not for national, but for local where you are upstairs and fairly high up. Uh, which is another reason you get accustomed to calling action off of a monitor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Olivia, let me just jump in here with calling off a monitor, which I had talked about uh, really well before with all the world feed stuff we've done. All of us have done different rehearsals when they say, Hey, we've got so-and-so think they can be a great analyst. Yeah. And we've uh, brought them into a studio and done a rehearsal off a, a screen. So we all have experience with doing that. You know, I, I don't know what you, what you do for football bird, but, I've gotten to the point where I do most of the football game off the monitor. I'll glance pre-snap above the monitor to see where receivers are. If there's a deep ball in the air, as the ball's in the air, I'll glance off the monitor to see where it is. I theorize two things along the way, and everybody has their own comfort level. Sure. I theorize that I watch 98% of the football that I watch on a monitor, as I watch film during the week, as I watch tape during the week, I watch other games. So my eyes and brain are trained to watch it on a foot on a monitor. The camera is a better lens than these glasses and it's a little bit closer and more intimate. If there's a fumble in the pile, how many times have you heard an announcer not recognize there's a fumble when you have these 300 pound bodies trying to get a ball? So I, I just call most of the game off a monitor anyway. So it wouldn't impact, I think, how some of us call the game, but what's missing are the things that you cannot see on a monitor yeah. that you pick up out of the corner of your eye. And that's where for our craft or for anybody who does play by play, we'll be a little more challenged to be at the same level that we have been over the years. Yeah. And I've seen your setup, Mike. I've been fortunate enough to do a Monday night game when you were working those right. or we've been at the same site. Uh, it's like NASA. Like you have a really good setup, the way the monitors are set up and, and they figured out the best way to put you in a position to succeed. And that's all that we ask for as a broadcaster. Right. The difference when you are in a, a separate setting in a studio, <clears throat> obviously, is you're not getting a feel for the environment. And now with no fans potentially, look, the NFL – you mentioned it earlier, just to piggyback, they're going to have to have a number of contingencies in place, uh, right. a plan with 100% capacity, a plan with 75% capacity, a plan with 50% capacity, a plan with 33% capacity, and a plan with no fans whatsoever. How the networks factor in, yes, we're partners, but that's going to be our business of how we want to handle right. it, how we want to deal with it and how to best put this product on the air. Uh, ultimately, how the broadcasters deal with it, it's going to be a very personal thing. Uh, I'm more along the lines with you, and this has happened to me as the years have gone on. I've definitely bec become more monitor dependent in a live mm -hmm. football format than I was earlier in my career. I was trained in radio, and right. the radio training was binoculars, watch the play, watch the snap, watch the completion, and then take off the binoculars to get a broader view. Yeah. I've made adjustments through the years. And also, what are we taught as television play-by-play -play announcers? Talk to pictures. pictures. Mm -hmm. That's right. your job. The, right. That's what the audience is seeing. So make sure you're mirroring what the audience is seeing. Okay. We are going to... Um circle back to collegiate sports because we have a question from 1988 former SU rower Jackie. She would like to know, and Mike, maybe you can lead us off here, of what you think the impact of losing revenue <clears throat> sports will have on the non-revenue college sports. What happens to rowing? What happens to track and field if we don't play football? Jackie, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, thanks for thanks for contributing to the regatta back in the day at Syracuse. It was always a good June event that we'd all cover and enjoy um, an adult beverage at along the way in the later <laughs> afternoons, too. The IRA regatta was a cool Onondaga Lake part of summer. Um, that That's what I think we all have concerns about, what I have concerns about. I think the people at the top of intercollegiate athletics and say office in Indianapolis – 
all the athletic directors, the conference commissioners, uh, they're, they're talking about it because the importance of a football season does directly impact the bottom line at every school. There aren't schools with this massive war chest that we can lean back on. And the, the, the concept that university athletic departments are sitting on this pile of cash uh, is a false one. A lot of the money goes to a lot of the things. Again, think of all, all the travel for all of the sports uh, as you have conferences that have geographically spread out, you know, for, for Syracuse volleyball to play a conference game at Miami or at Duke or, you know, Wake Forest or you know, any schools. I'm just picking distance, not necessarily matchups. There's, there's a cost. There's hotel, there's airplane, all that stuff. Those things add up when you multiply the certain number of sports. Now, for these Power Five conferences, there is a minimum number of sports you must offer. But for some of the other conferences, we've seen Mountain West as a conference petition the NCAA, can you reduce our number of required sports to be Division I? Why is that important? Well, if you are still a Division I conference, you're still one of those teams getting an automatic bid to the men's NCAA tournament, and all of your conference gets – the big money that Ian's uh, CBS group hands out with Turner as well to the NCAA, right. For March madness. That's sure. a significant part of the budget that everybody got hurt because they didn't get that full share this year. So the mountain West, if we can't offer sports within our conference, uh, the, the prerequisite number of sports, then we've got a big problem because we lose out on NCAA tournament money. So those are the problems that are out there. I think the economics are real. Uh, at a school like Michigan or Ohio State or Florida, where they offer a ton of sports in terms of numbers, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, that's why a lot of us have said, hey, Syracuse should add uh, men's ice hockey. You should add a baseball team. You should add a golf team. You should add this. Should add yeah, add it. Great. But you've got to fund it, too. And funding it is, uh, is the challenge. So that's why all of this conversation with, around college athletics has been, how are we going to get a football season in? Yep. Would we even think about playing in the spring? Uh, can we split the season if something happens in the middle of the season? That's why all of this has been scenarioed, thrown on the table, and is possible. There, again, there are no answers, but without college football, there is a significant long-term impact to the Olympic sports, used to be known as non-revenue, referred to more properly now as Olympic sports. Uh, there's a significant impact around the country. That's why this is the biggest conversation in intercollegiate athletics right now. And talking about collegiate athletics, um, I, if you can answer this, you have had two children at Newhouse. Linda is curious about how all of this is affecting the student experience, the student's education uh, at Newhouse, especially when it comes to the broadcast students. How do you see that this virus has affected their experience? Yeah, I think it's the mystery of, of what we're facing. As parents, what do we want to do? We want to make things as normal as possible for our kids. And I have a son that graduated Newhouse, had a tremendous experience, a daughter who's going to be a senior at Newhouse <laughs> and has really enjoyed her time there and enjoyed the classes and enjoyed the camaraderie. And what is this fall semester going to look like? Uh, I thought it was important that Syracuse got out in front and uh, determined that coming back early was going to help matters and leaving a little bit earlier uh, after the Thanksgiving break, recognizing that there's no reason to, to bring all the students back. You can get the curriculum in over that time period, but it's, it's hard to, to comfort your kids when you don't have the answers yourself. <clears throat> Look towards Sorry. leaders in these situations and I know that even the leaders can't say specifically how it's going to go. So all I ask of anyone that's in a leadership position right now is have the conversation, have good, strong communication, and keep people up to date as to what the plans are and how they're going to safeguard the university, and not just Syracuse, but any school and any kid that wants the real college experience. Uh, unfortunately, right now, uh, it's, it's impossible to say. Uh, the hope is the next month, the next two months, uh, we're getting more clarity as we get closer to August that students can get back. And if it is an amalgam <clears throat> of classroom setting and online learning, that might be acceptable initially. But uh, certainly, if that becomes the way that, that 
universities are going to operate, there are going to be a lot of people that are not signing up for that. Right. Yeah. Olivia, if I could just tag on to that real quick, I'll be brief so we can get to more questions. Um, being involved in the university, as Ian was talking about uh, the communication with the parents, uh, the administration at the university did a really, really good job of uh, getting together, not just an ever-changing situation on campus, uh, hundreds of international students who had no place to get back home, keeping them safe, healthy, fed on campus there in Syracuse, and uh, getting back into the United States, uh, nearly a, a, a thousand students who were overseas and in our study of over a thousand, in our study abroad programs. Uh, it was a, a Herculean effort and the number of emails that I would see from Syracuse on a regular basis of things that were going on, they were almost daily uh, in the height of this. And know that uh, during this stretch, once the spring semester has ended, uh, no summer obviously happening on campus, but the planning for the fall, uh, that's been pretty in-depth and pretty ongoing. So, and that's true across the board at every school, but uh, uh, Syracuse did jump out here early on in this piece and set itself uh, aside from some of the other peer institutions. And that's one of the thing I'll point out about sports. Like we talk about Syracuse in the ACC, isn't that great for this or that? And the ACC institutions are working together and sharing some best practices. Uh, and what's important there is that it of the power five schools, the ACC has the most private institutions with six Duke and wake Miami, Syracuse, Boston college and Notre Dame, which is a member for everything, but football and men's hockey. So it's very, very important that all of these schools are working together to share, hey, when Duke finds out something about this, or Wake finds out something about this, or even North Carolina public school, the presidents now have the relationship where they're able to share information. So uh, beyond, uh, hey, we're playing for the ACC title and this or that, the association of the conferences really does have a significant impact for the university. It's been really good to see uh, all of us coming coming uh, together to share what we find out as we try to help these decisions going down the line. Talking about the student experience, gentlemen, I want to point out that uh, Jerry Adler is has joined us. He is a 1954 Jerry. grad, 89 years old, and he would like to point out that when he was there, it was only the old library for classrooms. So <laughs> what we're doing and what the students have now are pretty, is pretty <laughs> hard luck. So we're glad that Jerry has uh, joined us. Love it. We are um, getting close to the time. So uh, we have one last question I would like to get in and it was on my list as well. So Alyssa, thank you for um, asking this question. Of course, there's a lot of things that we're missing. It's a scary time, it's an uncertain time, but what are some of the things that this time is done well for us? What are we gaining? What skills are we gaining? Hmm. Um, and what should we be taking away from it as we start to hopefully get through this? Uh, well, for me, normally Mike and I deal with a lot of stats in our job. The, the one stat that I am completely certain of right now, this is the most consecutive nights I've slept in my own bed in 1,000 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is not debatable. I know this for a fact. Uh, look, on a personal level, uh, of course, family time. Uh, Mike mentioned that there were students abroad. My daughter, Erin, was in Australia, so... The effort initially to make sure she was safe. My wife was visiting her at the time when everything really came to a head. So making sure family was okay. My son is staying here in New Jersey, heading back to LA very soon. That has been completely unexpected. Never thought in a million years we would get this amount of time with our two kids again together in the same place. And you know, fortunately, we do like each other. So that helps. It's a <laughs> drama-free house. <laughs> uh, on, a, on a professional side, it has allowed me to do some things that maybe I would not normally have the time to do. Recharging the battery for one. Uh, I think I might lead the league in podcast appearances right now. If they're keeping a stat for that, I've been a guest <laughs> just about everywhere you could possibly think on a podcast. And I have been able to review some of my own work and look at it from a different perspective because I'm not completely immersed in yeah. preparation, travel, game, 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 preparation, travel, wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> so it, it has been, it yeah. has been nice from that perspective for students. 
look, you have to use this time constructively and hopefully you've been doing that. We're looking into a camera right now. You have a camera. It's at your disposal. Work on your craft. Consistently work on your craft. If that's five minutes a day, so be it. If it's a half hour a day, if it's an hour, construct a newscast, construct a sportscast, start a, a sports talk show, do something that works the muscle in your brain that is required to do this well and to do it well all the time. We're all working in this field to get better at what we do. You're never a finished product. So try to use this time efficiently and productively if you have the means to do so. Yeah, great, great call. I agree with Ian 100%. Uh, a lot of the reason that Ian, yours truly, a bunch of us went to Syracuse is because of Marv Albert and Bob Costas and Dick Stockton, all off the tree from Marty Glickman before that. But uh, Marv's son, Kenny, is a friend to a lot of us. And uh, I was texting back and forth with Kenny last night. And Kenny said that last night was the 76th consecutive dinner at home for him. Uh, and I don't have that number because we've been out a couple of times. But I've, we've also set a franchise record in the Tarico household for uh, dinners together. My son is yeah. still going through his uh, college uh, year, his freshman year online. He's, he's in the basement, so I kind of bring him food and just ask him if it's better than the dorm food. Uh, there are things I haven't gotten to. For example, give me a second here. For example, I still have way too many VHS tapes that I'm trying to figure out which ones I really need to dub over and save. I, I'm thinking I don't need the 1999 edition of our Monday Night Football pregame show, Monday Night Countdown. No, that was I good. Really I think I need this, but um, that was a good show. That was a good show. Maybe yeah, I, good maybe show. I'll keep, keep that week one. one, not week three. <laughs> yeah. I've got a bunch of those in here that I have. <laughs> that those are some of the projects I was hoping to get to. But uh, to turn it to a serious point, Ian is a thousand percent right. If you are young in this business, if you are a student thriving to get in this business, what an opportunity to get good in front of a camera, on a microphone practice, tear yourself apart, uh, give yourself the most difficult criticism. You can't get better. You can do that. Guess what? If we're going to be broadcasting games off of monitors, when ESPN re-airs the, the game, whatever game it's going to be, go back and find the roster from that game and go broadcast the game. Yep. Do it off a monitor because that's what we're going to be doing apparently for a while in some cases. So why not try it and figure it out? Um, and I think for, um, for all of us, I'm going to lean on something Mark Cuban told me on uh, our interview show on NBCSN yesterday. He said, this is time when entrepreneurs and people who can figure things out, the smart, successful people, this is the time when they win. It was almost like a financial advice of you kind of buy low, right? It's the time to figure out in the new world, digital, sanitized, safer, Human interactions will be less person to person and more digitally. How do I do it? How do I find a way? And the smart, creative people are going to be the winners here. So kind of take that approach of how am I going to come out of this better? Don't complain and whine about, oh, I don't get to stay at this hotel for this broadcast. I don't get to do this job that I wanted to. Figure it out. Nobody ever wants to hear how much rain you got at the golf course or how much sun all they want to hear from the superintendent is how'd you get the, how'd you get the fairways looking so good? The greens are incredible. How, how'd you do that? They just want to know that they look really good. They don't care the problems you have. And that for us as broadcasters, for communicators, for educators, that is our challenge right now. Figure out a way, do it best we can and don't look back and say it was easier then because it was. But now we got to make it better now as opposed to easier then. I think that simple advice should uh, strengthen and enhance everything that all of us do right now as we approach our jobs and our lives as well. Here, here. Well, I cannot thank you both enough. And thank you to all of the alums and students um, that have come and to be a part of this conversation. I and Mike, I know that you are both staying busy. And I am so happy that you are both and your families are staying safe as well. Thank you guys so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Olivia, Olivia, for what you do. Yeah, thanks for what you're doing for the school, Terrific. too. And everybody, keep supporting Newhouse, keep supporting Syracuse, and uh, keep the family close to you. Stay safe. Yeah, great seeing so many familiar names as part of this group chat as well. And as we all reconcile our feelings of what's happening in the world and how it affects sports, you know, let's keep in mind the most important part, staying safe and being kind to one another as well.
All the best. Thank you both. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Please stay safe. Go Orange. Go Orange. Oh,